everyone. Uh, welcome, church family, to our River City Calvary Chapel of Sacramento. Let me make sure this is up. River City Calvary Chapel Thursday night Bible study, and we're plodding along verse by verse in the book of 1 Corinthians. Last week, we just opened up chapter 15. We kind of got a little crack in the door there where Apostle Paul, after having to confront this Corinthian church, now with yet the most serious issue that had come upon this church. Previously, he had to correct them on issues of division. There's just splitting. There's all kinds of factions that had come within the church. Then sexual immorality, we had talked about that. I think chapter 5, where some man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. Christians were taking fellow Christians to court. There's marriage and divorce questions. Some people are thinking, well, wow, I'm a, I've been baptized. I'm a Christian now. And my spouse, he refuses or she refuses. Do, do I divorce him? Do I stay married? And then there are lingering issues with the pagan worship rituals. They were still surrounded in a culture of pagan worshipers and temples all around them. And how would that affect them? And then incredibly, he had to deal with issues with impropriety in the, during the communion services, people are actually showing up like it was a party, a big potluck, and getting drunk and just not even honoring what it was. And then in the past three chapters, Paul had been dealing with uh, basically the gifts of the Holy Spirit and trying to get this church back in order. But now again, it's uh, really the most egregious error of all, that some in this church were doubting and even rejecting the cornerstone of the Christian faith, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, indeed our resurrection as believers into eternity. So Paul has to get right into their proverbial faces and, uh, and about this, because, you know, he's saying, if this resurrection, what we have told you and shared with you, is just a myth, then we might as well just close up the church. We might as well close the doors, and he says, we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because literally there is no hope apart from that. There's no purpose in life, and it's foolish that if we spend one more second of our time, one more amount of our treasure or our talents in, in this belief, if this is not true. But that's the point of chapter 15. Our faith, the fact of the resurrection, has a firm and sure foundation, historical fact, which we're going to talk about. And indeed, if anyone, as many people have in the past, have, have studied this and came to it with an open mind, would see and consider that these truly are believable and historical facts. And I think they would bow the knee to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the resurrected Savior, because of the preponderance of evidence. So let's jump right into it. We're going to reread the first part of chapter 15, which we had started with last week. And let's see what Paul has to say to this wayward church. He says in 15.1, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Otherwise, your faith, he is saying, is worthless. Otherwise, <laughs> you might as well just move on. In verse 3, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. My, my cat is really interested in ch chapter 15. I'm going to have to get the zookeeper over here to get the cat. There you go. Well, let's pray before we get going. Lord, uh, we just praise you for this word. And let us, O oh God, uh, have open hearts and ears to hear. And let us, Lord, receive. The, I pray your Holy Spirit speak through me this evening. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just build up our faith and build up our, our, our belief in this beautiful historical fact, O oh God, 
that we would just be filled with the wonder and the glory of what you have done for us and the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week I had glanced over some of the silly arguments against the resurrection. I don't want to spend a lot of time with these, some of the really inane negative critiques by uh, the skeptics of the resurrection doctrine. And some of them are really were silly. There are those who just briefly go over them. There were those that said there was never really was a Jesus, that he was a myth, and that's been poo-pooed for generations by all the scholars by now. And then there are those who said, well, yeah, there was a Jesus, but he wasn't crucified. And again, that has been poo-pooed and sent off to the graveyard of silliness. But then there are others that say, well, yeah, he was crucified, but the disciples stole his body, and that long ago was... Uh, was uh, it was just foolishness to think that. Then it says that he was crucified, and these disciples thought they saw him, but it's due to mass hallucinations. We told you, talked about last week how silly that was. And then the one that's really one of my favorites is that Jesus uh, passed out when he was on the cross, and it was so painful, and they took him down. He was basically in a comatose state, and they revived him, and he was better, and then he walked around. That's what they saw. But here's my favorite because I just I had to bring this up because I just found out this week that this is something that floated around for a little while by a couple of writers, New Testament writers. Some actually opine because the, the historical evidence is so great they have to come up with an excuse. Some have opined that Jesus had a twin brother. Yes, a twin brother. And that on that cross, the one twin brother died, but the one that the disciples saw as resurrected was Jesus' twin brother. Wow, that is really going to a lot of work trying to dismiss historical evidence. But there is also a school of thought that we want to touch on, and it's a false school of thought, that the resurrection doctrine was a myth uh, that was developed later on. It was uh, years after the death of Christ, and it was literally an invention of people like the Apostle Paul, who in some crazy way were, were trying to keep this Jesus mystique going on and to give him prominence as a great religious leader, that it was a legend. In the same way that many other legends have grown over the years of some of the heroes of the faith, maybe like Paul Bunyan or something like that. And it's something that propagated as people had died away and people got old and the stories grew about this Jesus. But as legends go, there are actually people... In the university systems, historians, uh, scholars of ancient history that study and are experts and study how legends grow and have been perpetuated around these historical idols and legends and how they come about. Uh, Dr. Lane Craig, a philosophy professor, I'm going to have a hard time talking, a philosophy professor, theologian, and research professor, he says that studies shows on how legends develop has shown that it takes several generations for legends about historical figures or events to become common lore of a culture. He says that even the span of two generations is too short of a time for legendary tendencies to wipe out hardcore historical facts. So it's based upon those studies, if the resurrection event that we believe in was one of those stories about a historical figure that legends grew about him and, and was magnifying beyond what the historical facts truly were of this about this life of Jesus, we, according to, to the studies, we would not have the Jesus doctrine, the resurrection doctrine that we have now that was presented to us so early in the Christian church. We have reason to believe that there's no way, no how, that this story grew through the ears of the imaginations of religious charlatans. Many, many commentators and New Testament scholars, and this is in including skeptical scholars, non-Christian scholars, believe that this first chapter, these first few verses, verses that we read from 1 Corinthians, was part of a very early Christian creed. Now, of course, a creed, Christian creeds, is a statement of faith. Things that have been written down through the years uh, basically to codify the tenets of our faith. Uh, and a lot of times they were written to, to stamp out heresy and, and uh, error that was creeping the church. Many of us are aware of the Nicene Creed that developed around 320 AD. And basically the church would come together and say, this is what we believe. These are the main things. 
Growing up in the Catholic Church, I had to memorize in my catechism, I had to memorize the Apostles' Creed. And we had to learn, and basically it laid out all the tenets uh, that we believed in Christianity. The Nicene Creed starts out with these words, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And it's quite long, but it lays out all the essentials of the Christian faith. And of course, one of those essentials is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for us believers who have our heavenly hope in our Lord and Savior. But Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So it's universally believed that this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church was written pretty much around A.D. 55, maybe as late as A.D. 57. So it puts this, this declaration of faith, this creed that Paul wrote, probably around 25 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, certainly no more than one generation after that historical fact. But Paul also says in verse 3 that this information about the life and the death, a resurrection of Jesus Christ, was something that I have shared with you Christians in Corinth, and presumably it was when he had planted that church four years earlier in the year AD 51. So this legend that some might say, now as we're getting close to the historical event, it's now it's no more than 20 years after the death of the crucifixion event. But there's even something more interesting. New Testament scholars also take note that Paul says, what I have taught you about this subject is something that I have received. Paul says, I'm giving you something that somebody taught me, something that I, I learned from other people. So then the question is, when did Paul learn this truth about the birth, the crucifixion, and the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, Professor Gary Habermas, perhaps the most prolific writer and lecturer on the resurrection, he believes that this information that Paul received about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he shared with the Corinthian church happened to him probably in Damascus, but not too short, long after he was knocked off his horse on that road to Damascus when he was on his way to, uh, to uh, persecute the church. And most scholars put that around the year AD 35. So also looking at what scholars believe, most of them are now in agreement that Jesus Christ died in the year AD 30. So this would move that up, this so-called legend, but the story that Paul learned no more than three years after the death of Christ. The other option that Gary Habernas puts forth is that, well, if he didn't hear it at Damascus, then look at Acts 15, when he, uh, Paul had to go to Jerusalem, and he met with James and Peter and the other elders. And at that time, that is probably at the very least that when he heard the story, as he came together uh, with the, the Jerusalem elders to talk about uh, things that needed to be settled in, within the church as they were starting to get arguments. And that account, which you can read about in Galatians uh, chapter 1 and 2, when he talks about, I went there to make sure I was telling the same story with Peter and James and they had nothing to add to my story. So what does that do? That puts it at maybe A.D. 38. So that's more than, no more than eight years after the fact of the death of Jesus Christ. But what's even more interesting than that, even skeptic New Testament scholars, New Te his, ancient his, stor scholars of ancient history, those who are not Christians, many now are putting this creed, this foundational teaching about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ even earlier. Perhaps the most prominent New Testament scholar in America and skeptic, a non-believer, Bart Ehrlman, He's a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. He believes, and he teaches, and he has written this, that this creed, this Christian tradition, was developed and taught within a year or two of the crucifixion. And he goes about laying all the evidence for it. It's not something he just flipped a coin and came up with, and you, I don't have the time to go into it where he came up with that. 
But Paul is imploring these Corinthians when he's writing this, he says, hey, this is the gospel message that I was given and I'm giving it to you. When I came to you, I gave you this message that Jesus Christ crucified, died for his sins. That wasn't the end of it. If he was still in his tomb, your faith is worthless. And again, bottom line, if there was no resurrection, there would be no Christianity today. The followers of Christ would have melted away into history unknown and unheard of like so many of the false messiahs, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Paul stated, he said in verse 3, For what I have received, I have passed on to you as first importance. And Paul's emphatic about this. You can almost see as he's writing this from Ephesus. He's, he's, he's got to be like, man, what, do I, what can I say to get these guys straightened out? This is the most important part of your faith. This is the main thing. This is an article of our faith that is important on how we take this. All this churchy stuff that churches worry about. And I've heard about churches fighting over and splitting up over choosing the paint in the restroom or whether you should sing hymns or contemporary music or whether you need to wear a tie or is it okay to wear shorts. And Paul's saying none of that really matters. But you guys need to get hold of this. Because he's saying literally your eternal destination depends on this. This is not a trivial church disagreement. This is a foundation of what we believe in. And so what is the evidence that Rabbi Paul brings to us in 1 Corinthians? He, he brings to us eyewitness testimony. In our court system, you know that you can send someone to jail on the testimony of two witnesses. You can send someone to the gas chamber on the testimony of two or three eyewitnesses. And Paul says two or three, you, go, you just have two or three Look what I got. I got that. I've got, I got the three big guys as well as I got a group of people and I've got hundreds of other people. Let me tell you about it. He says, if you want evidence, number one, take a trip down to, to Jerusalem or Capernaum, wherever Peter was hanging out at the time. Go talk to the big fisherman himself. He's going to tell you not only has he seen the risen Christ, but he's talked with him. He hung out with him. He ate fish with him. Peter wrote in his second epistle, we read that he wrote to his, his, his uh, fellow believers, he said, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says, I saw him. I talked to him. He forgave me for, for denying him. And I, he was there. I touched him in the flesh. And after Peter, Paul then brings up, he appeared to the twelve, speaking of the twelve apostles. And of course, John the Apostle, he, he talked about it too in one of, his, one of the inner circles of Jesus' twelve. In his first epistle, John wrote this. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Jesus Christ. He said, the life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. Eyewitnesses. More than one. More than two. He goes on now, uh, Basically, he's doing what attorneys do when they want to confuse the, the defense or the prosecutor. He's now going to do a paper dump on him. He's just going to throw a bunch on him. And he says, oh, by the way, there's more than 500 people, brothers in Christ, who, who saw him at the same time, many of which are still alive. And of course, in first century vernacular, and we've seen it in some of the, uh, the parables, some of the stories in the Gospels, when they mentioned like there were 5,000 at the feeding of the fish and the bread, the breaking of bread, they always mentioned it was just the men. For some reason, they would not mention all the other people who were there. So quite likely, there might have been, rather than 500, there might have been 1,000 if they included the women and children. It might have been 1,200, twice as many at least. But please note that Paul says uh, most of these 500 people are still alive and kicking. You can walk around else. Go, go talk to 20 of them. Go talk to 50 of them. If that doesn't convince you, talk to all 500 of them. If that's what it takes to convince you. But then Paul says, I'm not done yet. You've got 
John, you've got the apostles, you got Peter, you got these 500 people, you still doubt? How about this? How about James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the one born of Mary and Joseph after Jesus was born, the one who lived in the same house as Jesus, the one that knew Jesus more than any of all the other apostles, who knew, knew Jesus when he had pimples on his face when he was a teenager, who knew Jesus all the way as he grew up. And guess what else do we know about James? James and the other brothers and sisters of Jesus were not believers. They were doubters. We read in Matthew, I believe it is, and it mentions that the brothers and sisters of Jesus, he named them out Simon, Josie, Jude, and at least two sisters in Matthew 13. But when we read in Mark 13, guess what they thought about their big brother? It says, when Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. That's what James thought about Jesus. He thought his brother was a nut job. I kind of think my brother's a nut job, but that's a whole different story. Sorry, Gary, wherever you are. But something, what happens to someone who, who thinks, who grows up with something, knows everything about him, does not believe what he is, thinks he's, a, he's basically crazy, something dramatic had to happen to him to turn around from being a skeptic. Not only just, not just a believer, but he became a leader of the Jerusalem church. He became not only just a leader, but he, became, became a, he wrote one of my favorite books of the Bible. Just so happened it's called James, the book of James, an epistle, and just awesome. And this is a man who risked his life, and we'll talk about what happened to him. Later on, but there's a third group of people that Paul mentions as the eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses, he says, and then to all the apostles. Well, did he just say the 12 apostles? What's this all apostles? I thought there were only 12. Well, of course, we've talked about this before. Remember, apostles in the Greek is just basically a word meaning messenger. So Jesus had gathered these 12 apostles originally, but we also read in Luke, remember in chapter 10, we read that after the Lord had done them, had the other 12, he said, appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of them to every town and place where he was about to go. So perhaps those 72 were messengers of Jesus Christ, and perhaps they too were apostles. But anyway, Paul says that there were other apostles of Jesus Christ that saw Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. So this might be who he's talking about when all the apostles... But then Paul brings to the witness stand, you're still not convinced. So as Paul says, talk to me. He says, to me is one who was abnormally born. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, in verse 8, 9, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. no. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So whether then it was I or they, it was that is what I, we preach. And this is what you believed. So it's kind of a funny thing, an interesting title to give yourself, uh, Abnormally Born. I think Paul was probably speaking of the fact of how he met Jesus was totally unique from the way the other apostles who met him on the fishing boats, or as Matthew met him and when he was collecting taxes, where Paul, he was basically on his way to Damascus, literally to arrest and to murder the followers of Jesus Christ because he hated Jesus Christ. And in that ever dramatic way, he has that epiphany as Jesus knocks him off his horse and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And most of us know the rest of that story. If you don't, open up your book tonight. That's homework tonight, Acts chapter 9. But Paul was blinded for three days until the disciple Ananias was told by Jesus to go take care of this fellow Saul, and he was told that this guy Saul was going to be a missionary, an eyewitness of the resurrection to the Gentiles. But I think it's very important that we take a look at the lives of these witnesses brought before us and what makes their testimony so significant. In my lifetime, and most of us have seen it, we've watched the news, and thank God it hasn't been recently, but we've watched men, women, and even children 
strap bombs around their waist and, and walk into a crowded marketplace and blow themselves up along with dozens of innocent bystanders. And often these martyrs were driven by a belief that in performing this heinous act that they were serving their God, that they were being true to their faith, that they were going to be rewarded for this suicidal act. And they died in the absolute belief what they were doing was true, that their faith was true. They died that this religious tenet that their imams and other people, religious leaders, had taught them that what they were doing was based on a religious fact of their life. But I would submit not a one of those suicidal bombers that we've read about in recent years, not one, nary one, would have gone through that suicidal act if they knew for a fact that these religious teachings was indeed a lie. There's no way. And that passage we read from 1 Corinthians, of these three men we have mentioned here, the three, Peter, James, and Paul, as well as the twelve apostles, not counting the betrayer Jesus, all of these men died. Every one of them were, were martyred for refusing to recant, refusing to say, no, Jesus did not rise, and I made it up. No, we stole the body from the tomb. No, we had hallucinations. I don't know what it was, but I, 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 I changed my mind. Save me. Not one of them renounced their faith. And they all died proclaiming that Jesus Christ laid in that tomb for three days and then rose again in bodily form. We know from history and ancient his, 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 those who study ancient history we know that there were other messiahs, so-called messiahs, that came along before Jesus. There was Judas of, a guy named Judas of Galilee. There was a guy named Thudius, or Thedius. don't know how to pronounce that. Simon of Perea and a guy named Athrongius. Again, not sure how to pronounce that. But history tells us all of these men and more were self-proclaimed messiahs. Self-proclaimed, we're going to save the, the Jewish people world and the Jewish country from the Roman Empire, and they believe that, that a lot of people follow them. They said, they're the one, we're going to follow them. Well, they all had one thing in common. Rome wouldn't put up with them. And similar to what uh, happened to Jesus, they were hunted down and murdered. They were executed. Well, what happened next? What happened to their followers? Their followers, their names have faded off into history. Their followers are disillusioned. They faded into history. And most of you have never heard of these guys. Why? What was different? What was different in the story of this Nazarene named Jesus? How, how and why did these other sects go away if the Christian sect of Judaism has not gone away? There's an empty tomb. If we were to do some diggings and find and look and hard, we could probably find the graves and the bones or the tombs and the skeleton remains of these other guys. But people have been looking, people trying to discredit our Christian faith. There are no bones to be found of Jesus Christ. You know, I've done a lot of reading and studying this in the past couple of weeks and surprised to learn some interesting facts about what the so-called higher critics of Christianity, what they believe about the historicity and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was under the impression that they all still believe these skeptics, what I was taught, what happened with the, uh, during the uh, Age of Enlightenment and on through the 20th century, that essentially that all the, the scholars at the time would just laugh at people if you believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They said, get out of here, you can't teach that in a class. No one would be allowed to teach in the university system. And that was the, the, the way the history teachers, ancient historians, New Testament scholars, even the Christian New Testament scholars taught all the way up to the 1970s and 1980s. But to my surprise, as I started looking at this, something has changed with ongoing research in New Testament, in the New Testament scholar world. The majority of researchers, the ones who are really into this, this is their bailiwick of study, not people that are English teachers, not people who are involved in the science, but the people who study New Testament theology, even the, the most, even the, the, the skeptics, believe that the resurrection story, believe that the apostles and the, what Paul wrote here, that they saw, they believed they saw the risen Christ. 
Indeed, there are many scholars to this day, right now, that believe that the resurrection story is, but they don't know what to do with it. And they come up with these silly stories, like Jesus had a resurrection, had a twin body, a twin brother that took care of the resurrection story. There's Dale Ellison of Western Michigan University, a New Testament uh, uh, historian and scholar. He believes that the apostles saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. E.P. Sanders, an, a professor of ancient history, he teaches and he writes in his literature that the apostles saw the risen Christ. They're not Christians. They're still skeptics. They don't know what to do with it. But the, based upon the historical evidence that they use to study all of the other ancient history, whether it's Julius Caesar, whether it's uh, Alexander the Great, when they apply the same methods to these New Testament writings and extra, the extra writings about Jesus Christ, there's enough evidence to believe that what the apostles saw was the risen Jesus Christ from the dead. But talking about suicidal bombers, no one would be willing to die for something they knew to be untrue, to be false. And again, all these apostles, except perhaps for the apostle John, all died and were murdered rather than denied that they saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Horrific tortures, cruel executions, yet never recanting what they saw. Back to James, the, the brother, half-brother of Jesus Christ. Very interesting case. Again, originally a non-believer until he, he met his brother Jesus, risen from the dead. I hope to see that. I hope they have a tape library in, in heaven. I want to see that meeting when James sees his brother like, oh, Brother, can you imagine the look on his face? Oh, I'd love to see that. But he became again a leader in the church, a beloved leader in the church. Tradition tells us that he was given the moniker Old Camel Knees. And why was that? because he loved spending so much time with his brother in prayer. He was known to go to the temple daily and, and kneel on those stony steps and, be, and spend hours and hours praying to his brother till he developed these huge calluses on his knees. Well, tradition tells us that James continued to preach the gospel in the Jerusalem area, so much to the point that when he was an old man, I think he was around 87, where the Pharisees could not take it anymore, so vexed the Pharisees that they... The tradition tells, them, tells us that he took him to the top of the temple and they threw him down to the ground and he lay down on the ground. He wasn't dead yet, so not having any mercy, they stoned him to death while he's lying there, never once recanting his faith and the resurrection of his brother Jesus. And the other 12, Peter's brother Andrew, according to 15th century religious historian Dorman Newman, Andrew, he went to... Patras in Western Greece in the year 69 AD where there's a Roman consul, proconsul, Agates, debated religion with him. He was, he was trying to talk him to give up this faith. Give your allegiance to the Roman Empire. Forget this Jesus Christ and you can live. Well, Andrew refused to denounce Jesus Christ. So, what does Rome do? They gave him the full treatment. He was scourged. And he was tied rather than crucified. They laid him out on a cross and tied to just let him lay there and died over several days. And tradition tells us that he's laid there on this cross that he preached the gospel to all the passerby are going by, never recounting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. James, the brother of the beloved John, we do have biblical scripture what happened to him in Acts chapter 12. It says, now about this time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, cut down in the prime of his life, second only, I think, to maybe Stephen as one of the first martyrs for the faith. Then there's Nathaniel, but, or also known as Bartholomew, little's known about him. We know simply that he was martyred, but there's some tradition that said he was skinned alive and then beheaded. One other tradition kind of lays it out that he was flayed with knives, meaning that they literally peeled his skin off while he was they just laid there. And then a severe beating and whipping. Indeed, literally though, this man was tortured for his faith in Christ, yet never, never giving up his faith in Jesus Christ. Philip, the apostle Philip, 
One source suggests that he was hung until dead. There's another tradition said that he was crucified during his ministry to Egypt. And then there's Thomas, doubting Thomas. He was the guy that wasn't there when it was appeared to the other apostles. Remember that in John 20. This is now Thomas, also called Didymus. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in the side, I will not believe it. So he kind of sounds like these New Testament scholars who believe there's enough historical evidence for the resurrection. But, you know, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to, I just don't want it. Well, a week later, we hear in the Gospel of John, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see, and reach, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas fell on his face, I think, and just, I bet he just hugged his legs and said, My Lord and my God. You want to know what happened to Thomas? The sources we find in the tradition on Thomas suggest that when he was in ministry in India, people who did not want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ stabbed him with a spear, and he too died without ever, ever recounting the resurrection story. Matthew the tax collector turned apostle. Again, tradition tells us he was a missionary. He was arrested in Ethiopia, and there he was staked or impaled to the earth by spears and then beheaded. Nice ending, never recanting, never recanting the story of the resurrection. Jude, not to be confused with Judas Iscariot, according to the Orthodox Church in America, Jude was in Armenia when he was crucified, and then he was shot with arrows 45 years after the, the death of Christ. And Peter, many of us are familiar with the death of Peter. Peter, again, he was arrested by Nero, and Nero was going to have him executed. Peter, feeling that he was not worthy of being executed in the same manner as his Savior, asked to be crucified upside down. And they honored his request, yet so heinous were the Romans that they actually took Peter's wife, it tradition tells us, and crucified her first right in front of him. So he had to watch his wife die. And tradition says, it said, Peter said to her, she was late, died on that cross, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. And none of them ever recanted. And lastly, Paul, my namesake, Paul the Apostle, this is a man who had the brightest future in Jewish society, trained in the best schools, Hebrew of Hebrews, destined to be a leader in the Sanhedrin. He had everything going for him. And what became more important to him than fame and fortune, he was moving up the ladder. He was going to have a life of luxury and prominence in Jewish society. Yet he lived a life of suffering and eventually dying for Christ and sharing the testimony in the same Corinthian church that he saw the risen Christ. He writes to the Corinthians in his second letter. He said, I have worked much harder I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. And I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers and danger from bandits in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. You get the idea who's in danger? I think so. He said, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep, I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food, I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else I face daily, the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? 
After all that fun and frolicking of 30 years of service to his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ, 30 years, it's estimated that he traveled over 30,000 miles throughout the Roman Empire, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in those 30 years, and living that way on the road, and, and being tortured, and being in dungeons, and being arrested, and being whipped. And what was his reward? He was arrested by the Emperor Nero, thrown into a, a, a dungeon, a dungeon that was, that was a place where no one ever left alive. You can go there in Rome to this day to see this, the Mamertine prison. All there was was a little hole in the top of it for, to bring a little bit of light in there. There was probably sewage in there and perhaps even bones of previous uh, tenants of that space. And after laying in that place, Emperor Nero put the thumbs down in the year 80, 66, 67, maybe 68. A Roman executioner took out an axe or a sword, and Paul was beheaded. Why, you ask, would these men do this? When they, why would they give up their lives when they had nothing, absolutely nothing to gain for proclaiming a lie? They lost fortunes. They were disowned by their family members just for proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah, crucified, died, and resurrected from the dead. That gained them nothing in the world's eyes, but gained them everything in eternity. We're going to close this out. I've gone a little bit long, but Paul has much more to say than this. We're going to try and jump on it next week and finish this chapter. But I want to share that my testimony of faith is largely when I was in that time, and we all have those periods of doubt, is this gospel message true? My gospel truth that my faith in Jesus Christ was cemented as I studied the life of Paul and the life of James and these apostles. It had to be true. Why else would they go through this? Such horrendous lives here on earth and never recanting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Having excruciating, torturous deaths. There's something... There's someone that appeared to them as an event that was earth-shattering implications that happened to each and every one of these men and the women that made them turn 180 degrees around and allowing them to be, spend their lives being apologists for the risen Christ. And just take a notice, just like those messiahs, false messiahs I mentioned earlier, if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, to this day, there would be no Christian religion. There would be no River City Calvary Chapel. There would be no Christians throughout the world if it was not for the surety of this belief by those first 12, by those 500, these followers of Christ. They would have just faded into history like those other false messiahs. So we'll continue this next week. We'll try and go a little bit faster. But Paul has a lot more to say about this and then we'll move on to chapter 16 and finish up the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's pray. Lord, let us be like Thomas. And let us stop doubting and believe. Let us, O oh God, cry out, my Lord and my God, to the risen Christ. And let us, any of us, O oh Lord, who have been wavering in our faith, have doubted this truth, O oh Lord, forever put that aside. And know, O oh Lord, that you died for our sins, but even better yet, you've risen from the dead, that we too will rise from our earthly bodies to spend eternity with you. Lord, bless this teaching. Bless the rest of our week. Lord, turn our hearts to your word every day. Let us, O oh God, be uh, missionaries in our work and in our homes and in our church to be servants, O oh God. Bless, let, uh, bless River City, O oh God, and we welcome you all to come here this Sunday at 10 o'clock. And we thank